everyone. I'm John Evans. Welcome to another episode of One on One. Football started out as fun for Connor Barth. If you look at pictures when he kicked at Hoggard High School or at the University of North Carolina, he had long hair. He had the beach guy kind of an attitude. Not a lot bothered him, and he had a lot of success at both of those stops. But then football became a job. And Connors had success at that job, surviving in the National Football League now, for 10 years. But making a living with his right leg, well, that's not always been easy. I think mm -hmm. once I got to college, my freshman year, kind of everyone kind of remembers that kick I had my freshman year against Miami. Yeah. I think after that kick, I uh, just, I think things changed for me a little bit, just put me kind of in a, on the map a little bit, I guess what you would say. And I think after my freshman year, I kind of had an idea of maybe, you know, um, I started looking around the around college to see who else was kicking, and I thought, you know, maybe I have a shot to to do this in the NFL. So I think after my freshman year, when I kind of settled down, I was like, maybe I have a shot to. Uh, to play, do something in the NFL and actually make a living uh, doing this. Mm -hmm. But high school, though, I yeah. mean, you know, first team All America at Hoggard. I mean, you know, set all these records at Hoggard and and doing all this kind of stuff. So it was still at that point in time, maybe just a way to get to school at that point in high school. You know, obviously, my dad's a professor. Mom, right. obviously, uh, she does in pharmaceuticals, and uh, they're more worried about you know my education and things right. like that. So they're like, hey, you can get a free ride. To so I think when I was in high school, it was all right. I can get a free free ride to college, I can help my parents out and not have to have them pay for college. And I was like, that, that was an eye-opening experience to me. And mm -hmm. uh, so I think when I was in high school, it was, all right, cool, I can play for free, essentially, in college. And then um, that's what you're kind of thinking about. And then you don't really think about the NFL stuff till you get older. And uh, so high school was more just enjoying the process and like, hey, you know, I can, I'm can i going to get to play and help my family out a little bit and uh, I get to play on a bigger stage than in high school, and obviously, you know, ACC is a it's a that's a big stage. So yeah, I was at that mindset. Not really. High school was more just kind of. I was still figuring it all out. Honestly, it was kind of a whirlwind. Even I look back on it now. I'm like, you know, in the in the All American Bowl game, I played. I had to kick off to Adrian Peterson, Ted Ginn, a right. bunch of, a bunch of guys that are still in the NFL. Chad Henney was a quarterback. Sure. So I mean, it's kind of funny when you look back. You're you know you're seven, eight, seven, 17, 18 years old, and you're I kicked off to Adrian Peterson. Now that guy's one of the best. Uh, running backs of all time in the NFL, so it's uh, it's in, it's interesting. So it was just it was uh, fun at that point. Yeah, very, more yeah. fun than than yeah. the business than it became later. I would imagine, right? Very much business now where I'm at. Yes, yeah. but uh, like I said, I think you know after my freshman year of college, you know people started, you know, saying putting stuff in my ear, you know, in my head about maybe you have a shot at playing the NFL, and uh, you know my sophomore year I kind of you know, I struggled a little bit, yeah. and and then junior year I had a good year, and kind of just as you get older, as you grow, and Junior year, you kind of get some feelers out with some agents and stuff like that, and where you might be able to see yourself playing. And uh, so, yeah, I kind of was more towards the latter part of my college career. Did you have the set that you wanted to go to Chapel Hill? What was the recruiting process like, and and when did that really truly begin? Uh, honestly, I was never set on on Chapel Hill. Um, <clears throat> I started working with my kicking coach Dan Orner. He mm -hmm. was the kicker before me, and uh, obviously Bill Dooley was coaching the JV football team at Hogger at the time, and and uh, they were always telling they kind of were very strong about go going to your in-state school and things like that and uh, honestly I was a Notre Dame guy all the way because my dad went to Notre Dame and that's where I kind of started watching football and that's where I got into the to the kicking thing I, I was watching a football game with my dad and I was like oh I could probably be able to kick a football so uh, Notre Dame was actually you know that was high on my on my list but they weren't recruiting a guy in my class which which was unfortunate, but um, it kind of worked out well because kicking sure. North Carolina condition-wise, as you oh, yeah. as you learn, is a lot easier than kicking Notre Dame when you know it's ten degrees out or yeah. and that grass and. But um, you know, I I really started getting recruited probably my junior year of high school, and um, to be honest with you, I, if I, I look back on it, I wish I would have enjoyed the recruiting process a little bit better. I didn't really, I committed immediately to Chapel Hill as soon as they offered me, and uh, I had you know it was kind of going to be between. And a lot of people don't know, but it was between Carolina and Ohio State. Mm -hmm. Ohio State had Mike Nugent. It was, you know, obviously probably oh, yeah. one of the best all-time sure. college kickers of all time. And uh, I would have had a red shirt behind him. And and then I was hearing things where I could start as a freshman at Carolina. So it was kind of like, oh, do I want a red shirt or do I want to just, you know, a lot of guys, it's a dream to just play immediately. Which looking back on it, I'm like, man, it would have <laughs> been, it might have been good to just take a year off to kind of, because I've never had a chance to kind of just enjoy. It's been start as a freshman, then start immediately in the NFL. Sure. So, uh, I think that 
um, you know, Oregon was recruiting me, Wake Forest. I mean, I wish I would have enjoyed, like you get five visits, I think is what it is. I wish I would have enjoyed, that's why I tell kids now, like go and take all your visits because there's no commitment. Go and enjoy right. and, and like travel and see the different schools. And that's one thing I wish I would have uh, done a little bit more. But I mean, obviously I'm completely 100% happy with where I went and sure. love Chapel Hill and it worked out. But, you know, it would have been cool to, to, to really enjoy that kind of aspect of seeing different schools like in Alabama or just to see the different aspects of everything at the, at the strangest time. recruiting story. Honestly, I, it's very, I'm very, I'm very, it's very bland. I mean, I, I mean, I went to a movie on my recruiting visit with, with, uh, Greg Warren was my host at Chapel Hill. He snapped in the NFL for, I want to say 13 years with Pittsburgh. Uh, mm-hmm. It's pretty, nothing too crazy. I mean, we, really? it was very, very tame. I don't know if it would, I think it was just cause I think he was engaged or married at the time in college, so it was a little bit different experience for me. So I honestly don't have any crazy. That's why I wish I would have <laughs> taken my <laughs> but trips. But didn't, didn't get a call from a coach as you're driving down Shipyard Boulevard or in the middle of doing something? Didn't get any kind of calls or anything? No, I was very, it was very, uh, they were, it was done the right way back in, right. you know, a lot of things have changed, but in oh, yeah. back in, you know, when Coach Bunning, I, I have to say, is stand-up classy guy and obviously still one of my best friends and, uh, I mean, just we always did it the right way. There was no, there was nothing, no ske- no sketchiness or anything like that. It was just, you know, I came up, had a great visit, got to see the campus and for a couple of days and enjoyed it. And uh, you know, when you can, when someone tells you you can start, you're going to be the guy. I mean, it's hard to pass that up. Yeah, I was going to say. Kick, I, mean, I, le- I mean, there was nobody, there was nobody walking on. There was nobody. It was going to be me. And if I decided to, uh, to, uh, to commit. And obviously, the funny thing is, um, in the camp, it was. There was a guy named Ryan Suckup who's oh yeah he's so, another pro kicker yeah pro kicker he kicked he's actually from um, Hickory North Carolina mm-hmm. and his dream was to go to North Carolina I mean, and he, that was like his dream and he was a year younger than me so he was at the camp I was at and it was kind of between us two they were going to see how I kicked and then if I kicked well they were going to offer me there but if I didn't then they were going to wait a year to uh, to scholarship Ryan and. It's so funny because we still see each other, and I'm like, you know, uh, he's like, man, I just wanted to go. To, I really want to go to Carolina. I was like, hey, man, you took my job in Kansas City. I remember that? So it's <laughs> yeah, he got, me, he got me back, you know. So it's uh, it's a it's a small world, and uh, so it's yeah, like it was a pretty pretty straightforward process for me. I mean, it was, I mean, I guess like I said, I, if I could have done it over again, I would have. So that just, Miami game, I mean, yeah. you mentioned it the, uh, in, in your freshman year, that really kind of epitomizes. A kicker's life. Yeah. You miss early in the game, and then you come back against the fourth-ranked team in the country, make it at the end of the game, and all of a sudden, you're the hero. Yeah. And everybody in Wilmington is, is, <laughs> is on the Connor Barth chain. But that really, in one game, capsulizes the life of a kicker, doesn't it? I'm glad you said that. No one knows that I missed a kick. Everyone forgets that I missed that 30, I think I still remember, 38-yarder yeah. left hash and... Uh, because they just remember the one that you made. Oh, that's the that is the life of a kicker. I mean, either either they love you or they hate you. And uh, that night, thank God, you know, I, I put it through somehow. And uh, I mean, it was, I mean, that was it was. I don't even remember. I mean, it was. There were people already on the field. I think before I even kicked the ball, they were already jumping over the hedges. And so it was kind of one of those things where I better make it. And uh, <laughs> yeah. the funniest thing ever from that night is. Coach Bunning, we always because I I usually go over. He lives in Hampstead, right? I usually go over to his house um, during the NFL, during the playoffs, and I'll go. We'll watch a game or two, and uh, we always joke because he tried to come out and talk to me, and I just kind of pushed him away, like I got this. And then the funniest thing is Coach Powell, our running backs coach at the time. I didn't get it because I was just, I don't know, the, you know, everything was just as a whirlwind. And in the timeout before I I kicked it, uh, he just came to me. He's like, "Hey man, don't eat yellow snow." I was like, <laughs> so it took, I didn't, because, you know, you're thinking about a hundred other things, and he was just like, don't eat yellow snow. And I'm like, all right, coach. Thanks, Appreciate coach. That. Yeah, and then, Preach. and then after the kick, I was like, oh, my God, what, look what he, you know. So, you know, it's just anything yeah. you can say, and uh, we always just joke about it, because coach was, coach Bunning was like, man, you just pushed me away, and didn't even, I was just like, yeah. you know, it's, I was in the moment. And, uh, yeah, and, it's and, but just, it's just amazing that, you know, it could have been the other way. I mean, the other way would have been. Yeah. Had you made it earlier and then missed at the end, you know, it is. It, how long did it take you to develop that mindset of a kicker? Because you've got to have, I imagine, a short memory. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think that, honestly, growing up here was has kind of helped me a lot. Um, kind of that beach, I had that beach mentality, the long hair at the time, and uh, just kind of a, the carefree, just kind of nothing really bothers you. You just kind of, you're level-headed, and I think um, that's what separates a lot of kickers is just, 
You never get too high or too low. I mean, a lot, a lot of times in pregame, you'll see guys just going nuts. You know, regular players, well, they're going out there and hitting people all the time. So they got to get a little juiced up. And, right. But for us, it's just you got to be very even keeled and just kind of just, you know, trust the process, trust your preparation. And, uh, you know, I, I thought it was a pretty mature – I was pretty mature, uh, you know, as a freshman because, I mean, I, I had to jump in there and – you know, I went in in the summer early, and I think I was pretty mature for being a freshman at 18. So I, I kind of, you know, playing at Hoggard, we, you know, I kicked a lot of field goals at Hoggard. I mean, oh, obviously yeah. it's a different, different in college, but you just kind of never want to, you never make it too big of a stage. You just kind of be like, all right, I've, you know, I've done this in practice all year, and just you just got to trust it. So I think it's one of those things. It's a mindset. Is just you just, I think the people that are around you, your family, your friends, and just where you grew up is really being in Wilmington is really kind of kept me centered and it's able mm-hmm. to let me kind of just relax in, in moments like that. Let's jump out of it for one second. Yeah. Growing up here, what did you want to do? I mean, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're in high school, you're kicking, you're playing sports. Did you have any idea that you may have want to follow dad into education or follow mom? I mean, did you have any kind of future thought or were you just a, like my kids, just carefree teenagers and, and doing what you need to do and getting the homework done every night and then going to class the next day? I was, I was a little carefree there for a little bit, <laughs> sophomore, junior year, but I, uh, you know, I got, I got it together, but, right. uh, no, honestly, there's a funny video that my family friends showed me when I, uh, when they came to visit about five years ago, and uh, it was me when I was like, I, don't know, I was I wasn't even I was in kindergarten or something. And they were asking me what I want to do. I was like, I want to be a professional. I want to be a professional football player. Oh, really? So I didn't even. I just I, I don't remember the video and right. And it was so funny, and uh, and they were just the videos joking. My mom's talking. She's like, I'll make sure I get my parents' tickets and everything. And it's just a funny. I watched the video. I'm like, holy moly! It's really, it's it kind of gave me goosebumps. Cause like, you know, I never knew that I said that, but I right. guess I, I guess I did. And I was like, I'm gonna buy my parents jet skis and <laughs> all this stuff. And it was just a funny video to see because it was like from a we used to uh, vacation in the Outer Banks when mm-hmm. we lived in. My dad taught at University of Memphis, mm-hmm. so we would go there, and uh, that's where we. I guess the video took place, and I was young, and so I guess it it all worked out. But yeah. uh, I don't. I look back, and I don't. I don't know. I mean, I've always been into sports my whole my, mm-hmm. whole my whole life and we obviously soccer was my um uh, was my was a, was a big passion on the baseball I, baseball was my biggest passion when I was growing up in Tennessee but when we moved here in sixth grade I just something kind of I don't know if I got burned out we were, we were playing 80 games a year oh, yeah. and just uh I just kind of lost 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 touch with it and I think that was probably my best sport but you know, and now that I look at the contracts that are getting signed in baseball, I'm like, <laughs> man, maybe I should have kept playing because I got a couple of buddies who are still who are playing in the in the in the MLB right now. So it's uh, it's funny, but yeah, I don't know. I think I was I was a sports guy through and through. But yeah. my dad, obviously, my mom always pushed your grades, and mm-hmm. obviously, education is huge for us. And I, I learned early that you know you got to make a lot of sacrifices to yeah do what you want to do because if I don't do well in school, then I mean it's kind of cliche to say that but it really is true i mean if you sure. don't i've seen a lot of a lot of teammates and friends from high school who had so much talent but your grades are just you know if you don't have the grades you can't go into juco but you know you can try but i mean it, it really they gotta remember that if you, the higher the gpa you get in in high school the lower your SAT, you know you lower your sat score has to be so if you can kind of if you can do something better than the other you know i'm not a great test taker but if you can really focus on school and get a really good gpa mm-hmm. you can you know, you can, it evens out. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, for me, it was just, I think I was a sports guy and that's what I wanted to do. And I knew soccer wasn't going to be probably what I, f- what I focused on. Cause you know, to get to Europe to play soccer is, it's yeah. kind of the, that's the cream of the crop. And, you know, Cody Arno was able to do it and I had a great career. And, um, and, but I just knew I wasn't quite there to do that. And I knew that's where the big money was. Mm-hmm. And so I, you know, someone can you know, I watched a football game and I was like, maybe I could do this kicking thing. And, uh, you know, it, it all just uh, kind of worked out. I've so. known your family for a long time. Not only, you know, Tom and Sue, mom and dad, but I've known your Aunt Mary Pat. And, you know, she's very close to our family and has been for a long time. They're a very grounded family. Education, faith mm-hmm. is very strong in your family. How much did that play into you? You're talking earlier about you being a mature young man at 18. Did that grounding and did that heavy faith and strong faith in your family play a role growing up? And does it still play a role now? Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, my my aunt Mary Pat was a, she was a nun. My dad's brother is a priest. I mean, it's we're a very faith, if, you know, a very we're a very grounded family. Faith is huge. You know, I mean, we're a very um, Catholic family. I mean, right. I, I mean, to be a kicker, you can't. You gotta. You know, there's a lot of it's not about you. It's about the man above. And uh, I mean, he's helped me a lot. I mean, it's. But I mean, I just think that. 
yeah, just my the family, my my family surrounding me has just been so supportive, you know, and just about, you know, they've never, you know, they don't push you too far to where you just don't want to do it anymore. They're just very, they're there to support you. And uh, I mean, my parents sacrifice a lot to to do what I want to do. I mean, those, you know, football camps aren't cheap, and uh, you right. know, it's so for me to be able to pay them back and get a scholarship, and then obviously my brother as well. It was just a that was like a bonus to yeah to see him uh, get a scholarship as well. So I think just. Yeah, I mean, our family's always been just very, just low key, just very, just centered. Yeah, we're just very centered and uh, just we just I don't know. It's just we're just very low key family, and we just no, I know, but but you know, the one thing, and I've uh, you know I've followed you since you played at Hoggard, and you know you've enjoyed your success, but I don't think I've ever seen you think too much of yourself and the reason i say that is you see a lot of people you know out and about and 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 doing all these partying and everything else like that connor bart's never really got in trouble Mm -hmm. connor bart's never been in the headlines for doing this and that and i think that really kind of has to come from the grounding and the faith of your family yeah i've just always been uh nothing's ever come easy to me i mean i've always been you know there's always been something about like i'm not strong enough my leg's not strong enough i'm not you know you're not this you're not that i mean i I've just never wanted to be, I've always wanted to be this, I've always told myself when I grow up, I'm never going to, like, no matter what happens, I'm going to be the same guy I've always been. I'm not going to change. I'm just going to, you know, people do think I've changed, you know, like people that don't know me as well. Sure. I get, right. if, it's funny to, it's funny being in a small town of Wilmington, it's when people don't, until they meet me, mm-hmm. a lot of people have very stereo, they stereotype as you as an athlete, as just cocky, jerk, just, and I've seen it from just being around town and yes, I do like. I like. I'd like to drive nice cars. I like. Sure. But well, I mean, but, you know, but you've work, worked for that. Yes, and right. It doesn't mean that doesn't has nothing to do with who I am as a person. But it, I have seen it. I mean, I have friends now that some of my best friends when they first met me, you know, five six years ago, they're like, "Man, I did not think you were going to be like this." And I mean, it's just until you really get to sit down and get to sure. know me. I'm a I'm a generous. I, I you know I love giving back and doing stuff in the community. Anything I can to, to help out and. You know, but there is that, you know, with social media now today, I mean, um, yeah. people see, I mean, people look, you know, you see the different guys that are, there are guys that just love the spotlight. And, uh, and I mean, but for me, it's like, you know, until you really sit down and, you know, I'll take a girl out on a date and of course they have perceptions of who I, they think, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not gonna be nice. I'm going right. to be very conceited, just talk about myself. And I'm not gonna, I mean, every time we finish up the date, it's, you know, wow. I I mean, pretty much I'm going to say, you know, every girl has said, wow, I did not think you were going to be like this. And it's just like, I I think that people, you know, they see all these athletes now today sure. who are just think they're just uh, higher than everybody else mm-hmm. and can get away with whatever they want. And, and then it's just really, I'm just, you know, I'm a kicker. I'm not a, you know, I'm just mm-hmm. a, you know, I'm a normal guy that just got, I'm, you know, I take it, take my, I'm, it's a job. I mean, it's yeah. not like it's, right. it's not. You know, I'm blessed to be able to do what I do. I mean, I play with, I've gotten to meet some really cool people, but sure. it's still just a job like everyone else does. I mean, you know, it's it's the same thing that, you know, it's just, there's nothing different. I just happen to be playing in front of a lot more people. And You've been in a lot of huddles. Yeah. Starting, so, in, starting at 10th or 11th so grade. So it's just, uh, so tell yeah. me the difference. Is there a difference? You get to Chapel Hill. Is there a difference between a college huddle and a high school huddle? Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, the co- it's not, like I said, high school's fun, right? So right. high school is yeah. just, you know, college is still, you know, it's still fun. You know, you know, you're not, you know, it's your, your parents are still helping you out. You're not having to mm-hmm. provide for your fam- your family yet. But so college and high school is not too much too off, but NFL is, is a whole nother ball game. I mm-hmm. mean, I remember, um, you know, I was playing for Denver in 2014 and obviously Peyton Manning is the quarterback. Sure. And, uh, <clears throat> we were playing, we were playing at San Diego to clinch the AFC West title and I came on for 49 yarder, and he walks off the field and he goes, "Hey man, we really need this." And I'm like, oh, "All right, okay." <laughs> so the sheriff just told me we need, you know, it's like that's a whole other. Yeah. I was like, "Wow, I better not miss this." Thank God I made it. Yeah. But uh, it's the NFL is it, college and high school is still just kind of fun and and enjoyable. I, I thought, I mean, I think it was, and obviously it's changed a lot since mm-hmm. I've, you know, it's put obviously with social media and. Right. A lot. There was nothing like there. Was, oh, Facebook came out my freshman year of college in '04, mm-hmm. so that's all we really had. There was no Twitter. There was no right. Instagram. And uh, but the game has changed a ton in college now. With it is it is more of a professional sport. And uh, 
But, but even <laughs> but even circling around the guys, I mean, yeah. you know, it, you're playing NC State, and, mm -hmm. and, and there's still that rivalry thing. And, and is it still more, you remember it being more fun than, than more, even a business kind of an atmosphere in college? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, I honestly think that fans are, I think fans are more into the rivalries than, than the players are. I mean, we're just out there just because we never try to make it bigger than, you know, obviously when, NC, when you play NC State or Duke or those teams, obviously it isn't. There's an extra motivation to beat them. But uh, I think the, the, I swear the fans are just, uh, they are ruthless. And uh, That's short for fanatic. That's why, <laughs> we're, right? We're more, you know, the players, we're more like, all right, you know what? Let's not look at this as a, you know, as a bigger game than it is. You know, it's, a, it's another game. we got to win this one. And, and that's how I've always looked at it as well. So I think the – I mean, the fans are what make the game so special, and uh, but it's just uh, it's funny. I mean, you, uh, I, I watch games now. I'll go to games. And I'm looking at fans, and I'm like, man, you really do not like Duke or NC State. I mean, it is uh, it's it's intense, but it's but that's what makes that's what makes sports. Was great. the Mi and, was the Miami game the high point of the UNC career? Oh man, that that making that field goal. I mean, I know it, it, was, it was over four years, but I mean that had to be <laughs> national know? TV, ESPN, yeah. fourth ranked team in the country. Blah blah blah. It was. I mean, it it was, but there was a uh, honestly, my it was the high. It was probably the highlight of my career. It was that was that game. But honestly, the probably the best moment was you know my sophomore year. I slumped really bad. I mm -hmm. was, I think I I was like fifty percent that season. Yeah. You know, the end of the season, I came on strong my sophomore year, but. My junior year, I went 100%, went 11 for 11, and then made my, I think I missed three from the middle of my sophomore year to my, till, I, till I finished my senior year. I think that was, when I finished that last, my last senior year, when I finished that season out, I was, that might have been my highlight just because I grew so much, you know, just, I mean, one kick's great, you know, national television, but, you know, I could have gone in the tank and just, right. but Coach Bunning believed in me and, when I finished that last game against Georgia Tech, and I knew I, I hit my last like thirty-one to thirty-four, I was like, "Man, that's you know what? I might have just set myself up for to play in the NFL." And uh, so that's I think that might have been the highlight of my, my my career was just being able to know that I you know I I struggled and big time, and then I was able to come out of it, and that's what separates you, I think, as a player. And I, I knew that would help me in the NFL because there's going to be ups and downs. Sure. And it's never going to be easy. And I think, honestly, when I finished my, my last game at Georgia Tech, I was like, man, you know what? This might have been my – just to, to finish the way I did was yeah. kind of a special moment for me. Did you think – all right, you, you, you get done at Chapel Hill. You get ready for the draft. You don't get drafted. Was that a little bit – did that put a little chip on that shoulder there to make you want to succeed? Or was that a was that a, a, a hard slap in the face of reality, just kind of calling, calling around in the, uh, on the carpet there a little bit? I mean, it's always uh, you know, always have a chip on your shoulder. I mean, it's I, like I said, I've never been too. I never get. I'm always pretty level headed, and right. my parents are always pretty. You know, my dad, and my mom, we always talked, and you know, it's we. I, I had a feeling. I knew as kickers, it's very hard to get drafted. Mm -hmm. I took a visit to Seattle and thought that was going to be the team that I was going to because uh, they were pretty pretty high on me. I had a good workout, but you know, it didn't work out. And a couple other guys did get drafted in my class, but. I think it's, uh, you know, and I, I'm, I guess I'm the last one standing. So, I mean, I guess there's a little chip on your shoulder, but it's, like I said, I mean, I, I just, I knew just the past. And I think I was, like you said, being brought up in such a good family and having the support cast from uh, Dan Orner to a lot of my kicking coaches who said, like, you know, the, the chance of getting drafted are pretty slim, but the key is just getting into a camp somewhere. And uh, Kansas City obviously gave me that opportunity. And right. uh, so, I mean, it was, hey, listen, I got a $5,000 signing bonus. In yeah. 2008, and I was like, "You're a college kid." I was just like, "This is the best thing that's ever happened to me." So right. it's, you know, it, you know, it's, it's, it is what it is, and uh, it's kind of a cool thing to look back and and know that you were one of those undrafted guys that's, you know, that's made it, you know, actually had a pretty good career. So it's, uh, it's kind of cool. And there's only a few of us. I think me and uh, Dan Carpenter and right. are the only two that are I think still left. left. Yeah, yeah, left from your really season. From, yeah. My, from my, and then I mean Garrett Hartley was as well, but. Um, but yeah, there was a couple guys drafted pretty highly, and but um, Brandon Cantu and Taylor Melhaf. But you know, it's uh, you know, it, it, you'd rather you'd rather win you'd rather run win the marathon yes, than win the you know, sprint. It'd been it'd been great to get a big signing bonus up front, but obviously, if you can make a ten year career out of it, it's gonna be you're gonna make a lot more money and and then and set yourself up a lot better than if you just got that one signing bonus. But it's uh, yeah, I mean, it's. It, that's why it's hard now to really I, I feel bad for NFL coaches having to try to scout kickers. I mean, you don't know college does not translate to the NFL. I mean, it does in a lot of positions, but a kicker at the kicking position it's tough to really I mean, you see the see what's going on in Tampa. 
yeah. right now with you know they they signed uh shaking my head they you know that's a whole other whole other animal i don't even want to uh they brought in they okay just, i won't yeah. i won't ask you i won't ask you oh, that please, revenge please, that please question do, please do because i will get, i'll be very honest <laughs> so when you when you finally get out and you get you know it's kansas city and you walk into that first pro camp just awe or eyes wide open or is it just a completely different animal than anything you ever experienced it's just uh y- it's it's different. It, it opened my eyes a lot just to the whole just to the whole uh, to the whole just aspect, just the whole process, the whole just how much different it is from college. But the one good thing about playing at Chapel Hill is you know it was it was you know you're playing at a high level, and it's from a facility standpoint to this the stadiums you're playing in. A lot of times, college stadiums are bigger than professional stadiums, and uh, so the transition wasn't terrible because. Uh, you know, luckily playing at that level. If I played at, I think a D three school or a D D two school would have been, you know, in front of ten thousand. But right. I think being able to play Division one really helps the transition a ton. And uh, it, it, my eyes were wide open, but I also knew that you know what, you know, you got to have that kind of you have that confidence, not a cockiness, but just confidence right. yeah. that hey, you know what, I can. And that's a difference. Yeah, there's, there's a difference a, yes, between the there's two. There's there's cockiness yeah. and there's just confidence, and you can't play in it. You can't play professional sport if you don't have confidence. I mean, that's just that's a that's like psychology one hundred and one. If you don't. If you don't trust in yourself and believe in yourself, then you're not gonna. So that first like anything, but so the first day when the coach comes in and tells you that you're cut in Kansas City, <laughs> what's that like? Yeah, it's just uh, yeah, I don't know. It was. It, I look back and I'm just. It, I don't even really remember. I've been. I've been cut so many times now. Right. That, uh, but it was. But just, you've always bounced back, it, and more on that in a moment. But the first day you're cut in Kansas City's camp. It was one of those. It was kind of a. It was kind of eye-opening experience, and now it's like you know what? Whoa, I gotta, wow, I gotta get a real job. So it's not like college where you know you're still enjoying your college experience, and mom and dad are still helping out. It's like whoa, like I'm, I gotta, I don't know if I'm gonna play again in the NFL. You know, it's kind of one of those just eye-opening, just uh, did this really just happen kind of thing. You know, you think you had, you think you did well, but you know it's, but you realize just how good the competition is and how hard it really is to make that that jump and, and be one of those elite guys that play in the NFL. And uh, I was just kind of like, man, I, I just called my dad and I just was like, what do I, what do I do now? You know, it's kind of one of those, cause you know, I just live with my parents. I'm 22 and uh, you know, you get, you get a little sign and bonus, but not enough to really take care of you. So I, you kind of just step take a step back and that's where you're kind of like, all right, well I graduate, you know, I got my, 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 I got my degree at Carolina, you know, we can, I'll start doing some interviews and, because I've always heard of guys taking a few years as a kicker to get in. So I knew, like, uh, you know, I was pretty well trained where I knew it might not work out the first time. And, you know, uh, Matt Bryant, who kicks for Atlanta, has been kicking. Yeah. He, he was, I think, stocking shelves at a grocery store or something before he got a mm-hmm. before he got his call again. And so, I mean, I knew it could take a couple of years. So, you know, I, I was proactive and came back here, um, got my insurance license, and uh, was going to do some insurance stuff. And just kind of trying to – I was working at the uh, golf course in Chapel Hill just doing some stuff just because you can't really get a full-time job because sure. you got to still train. And mm-hmm. until you give up that – that until you give up the dream, you got to kind of do something part-time and someone's got to understand. So I was always pretty – like you said, my family, I was already – I was pretty well prepared for, you know, what, what could have happened. What could happen. I was always – I'm always one of those guys that's like, you know, eh, if I, I might not – you know, I was kind of – I was ready to get – you know, if I knew – if I was going to get cut, I was ready for it, you know, because yeah. I just knew it could have come. And So then it happens again in Miami. You're signed. You're cut again. <laughs> then you're signed in Tampa Bay, and there is where you found really the first long-term success yeah. right. there for several years. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, – after the Miami – getting cut in Miami was probably the lowest point just because – you're living in a hotel. You actually outkick the competition, and absolutely, I mean, you should have gotten the job. But you real, come to realize that's when I came to realize how much of a business the NFL is. That you know, they just I've, they just brought me in just to kind of push the guy in front of me, just to. See. And you didn't know that at the time. You know, you're you're still young. I still only had the one year in Kansas City. I'm still 23. I don't know the business, and and I'm like, I just went 41 for 43. How do I not? And how do I not get the job? And then obviously their guy missed a lot more than I did. But sure. you realize that you're just they're just trying to light a fire under the guy that's been there. And obviously uh, he had a great he's had a great career in Miami as well. And that's Dan Carpenter. I got some payback on him against him. I had three fifty <laughs> yarders against him when I signed in Tampa. So it was. Yeah. But no, I was sitting on the. I remember I was sitting on the sidewalk. I always I give whenever I give a. I'll go out and speak sometimes, and I'll talk about. It. I was sitting on the sidewalk by the hotel, and I just called my dad, and I'm just like, I don't I don't think I'm gonna do this anymore. 
it was just you know you're living out of a suitcase for the last year and a half and you know I, you just want some stability so I, I was pretty low point you know I was after Miami but you know you got your your agent and your family to kind of keep pushing you and you know I actually changed agents to a different guy named Rob Roche um during that period and uh he kind of really he, he believed in me and I, I probably should have signed with him when I came out of college but uh he was just like man I know you can kick in the league and probably the biggest positive I got was the uh Bill Parcells he, he was he was with the Dolphins at the time he was I think kind of like a, a consultant type uh, mm -hmm. he came up to me when I got cut and he was just like you know what you remind me of a guy like named Adam Vinatieri and that was kind of a wow. pretty cool to hear you know like he was like you're gonna you're gonna make it in this league just you know it just might it's not here but someone you know but you look back and you think about it now after I've been doing it for this long you're like dude just you're just blowing smoke up you know but you know, to hear that that young at that time, yeah, it was a good thing for you to hear. It was huge because you know I don't know if he was just saying that or if he really meant it, and I think he really did. And obviously, Vinatieri's he'll be a Hall of Famer, and <laughs> yeah. uh, so to hear that I think gave me a little bit of a little bit of hope. And uh, so yeah, I mean, Tampa signed in Tampa that that same year, and and then you're settling in there, and you're the guy yeah. there for three years, and really did. Yeah. I mean, you know records of three fifty yarders in a game, and and I mean, and you're the guy. Mm -hmm. And and then all of a sudden you come back and you try to do a, a charity game. Yeah. I remember getting the call that somebody said, Connor got hurt in the game. Yeah. And I can only imagine what that was like in your mind. Uh, yeah, you know, I, uh, I just, well, so the year before, you know, I was kind of hitting, I was hitting my stride. You know, I just signed the new deal last, the year before that in 2012. Right. And now that I look back on it, I was, don't know why I played in the game when I signed the deal because I played in that game that same year I signed it. Thank God I didn't get hurt, but, uh. Yeah, I don't know. It was kind of a, I don't know, freak acts. I don't know. It's 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 a tough one to. It's still hard to swallow because it kind of derailed my career pretty, pretty immensely. And uh, you know, once you have an injury like that, and you, you don't really see that at the kicking position very much, and yeah. being your kicking foot, um, teams are always, as I've learned now, teams are always going to try to find a way to say he's not as good as he used to be. Mm -hmm. And as soon as that happened, um, it was just kind of like a. I've never pulled a muscle. I've never broken a bone. Oh, and no, so, you, you've gone. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, when when it happened, I was just kind of like, you know, I didn't it didn't. You know, a lot of people say they go into shock and they're, I, not, I just felt like somebody s stepped in my back of my foot pretty hard. And, and I thought it was one of the guys that was playing. But obviously, it's a non-contact injury usually. And uh, it was, uh, you know, my family was there. My buddy before the game was like, just please don't get hurt. And I'm like, oh, my God, you jinxed me, man. Oh, man. And, uh, you know, my girlfriend was there at the time. And as soon as it happened, I was just kind of like, I thought I just, like, twisted my ankle. or, But then I was just like, something's not right because I can't, you know, I felt like my shoe was, if, if if the sensation is it felt like my shoe was completely loose off my foot, but it was actually completely tied. And obviously just your Achilles is completely yeah. not attached. So I had no movement in my foot. And as soon as I noticed, as soon as I, I felt that and I sat down, I was like, man, I think I did something pretty bad. And. It's just one of those things where it's just like it doesn't hit you for a while, and and then I just kind of like you, you, you kind of I feel like I had to be kind of a a rock for my family because I think my family took it harder than I did because mm -hmm. I knew my mom was my mom and dad were pretty upset and you know they saw how hard I've worked to get the deal sure. that I got and uh, you know I've only played one year of it and then this happens and uh, I just feel like I had to be the stronger guy the strong the guy you know that's just strong to kind of be like All right, everything's gonna be okay and things will be fine you know stuff happens you know right. it's just like you look back on it and it's like you know what you know all you can you i grew from it and i mean it's obviously there's a reason it happened you know you don't know what that reason is but you know uh something else bad could happen you know so yeah. and it could have been in tampa you know you never know so i think there's always a plan god has a plan i really do believe in that and uh i just tried to be this the rock of that whole thing and it hurt i mean it hurts because i mean from a financial standpoint sure it, it was uh it was a big. Uh, it was, was it was a big. It was a big loss. So. Was that another level of learning what the business is like? Oh, oh my gosh! I mean, because was... I mean, the whole contract squabble and and the insurance. I mean, you went through oh. so much just business wise that that that's when everybody I think around you really realized how right. difficult a business and how much of a business it is. And I'm not scared to say it. I mean, I just the NFL is a ruthless business, and I will say it 100. percent And the owners and and G GMs and they all have they have all the power. Players have no power in the NFL. We don't have you know our our collective bargaining agreement is not 
what baseball and other sports are. I mean, we have no, we have so much limited coverage from a non-football injury standpoint. It's just, I mean, you can't even live your life outside of football, outside the confines of the facility. And I learned that firsthand. I mean, I, you know, I, I hurt, I got hurt two weeks before camp or a week before camp. Mm -hmm. I had the surgery immediately, which was, which was awesome. And I think that helped so much with my recovery. I was able to get it out, you know, get back, get the surgery quickly and get to rehab. And, uh, but I went down to, to be there with the guys with my team for the first, you know, uh, the first start of camp, the first team meeting. And I should probably shouldn't have been traveling yet. Cause obviously when you get on a plane, you get swelling and, sure. but I wanted to be down there with my guys. And I sat down in the training room, Mark Dominic, obviously, you know, he great guy, you know, he's the one who you know believed in me, signed me to a big deal. So he said to me, you know, you're, you're going to come back better than ever straight to my face. Isn't nothing's going to happen. You're gonna be fine. You know, you know, you're going to get through this. You're gonna come back better than ever. I mean, I remember word for word. A week later, a couple of days later, he goes, "All right, we're, he calls my agent. We want to restructure your contract. This is like a week later. Yeah. You know, we're going to knock you down from, you know, so and so to pretty much half, not more than half my contract. And then we're going to do the next year. We're going to do the same thing. And it's just kind of like, are you kidding me? Like, you just told me to my face that, yeah, that I'm going to be back the same guy that I was before. And then you go and do this. So I had it was I broke down because this was in Tampa when I was flying back to do my because I did my rehab up here at." at Shoreline Physical Therapy, and uh, my mom and dad never seen me like that. And I was just like, man, you know, because I work, you know, you, you get paid a contract for what you've done. Sure. And, you know, and I've obviously had really had a great great years in Tampa. Oh, yeah. So it's like, man, you're just going to, I mean, people tear Achilles. I mean, the technology these days, I mean, guys come back just fine. I mean, you, you, there's a lot of big-time players in the NFL now that have torn Achilles and have done just fine. So, just to hear my GM to my face go, "Hey, you're gonna be fine, and this is all gonna work out, and we're gonna be, you're gonna be better than ever." And then a week later, it's like we're gonna try to take all the money from you. Yeah. And the worst part is he tried to tell me that you know the one of the you know luckily I got roster bonuses mm -hmm. because if I had signed a signing bonus, they could have taken that money from me. Yeah. Which is just like wow, you know, you just your eyes are you just learn a lot about the NFL and how it's just you gotta you know you gotta strike while it's hot and I learned a lot there that you just can't trust a. I think that injury and that whole situation hurt me from a confidence standpoint, just from like a, just, you just, you don't, you just don't, you can't trust, I don't trust anybody anymore. You yeah. can't, I never, I will never trust a coach or a, it was hard for me for a long time to ever trust a coach or a GM or anybody what came out of their mouth just because like, how are you going to say that to a guy who's. Yeah, firsthand. I mean, if somebody tells you about yeah. it, but actually they looked you in the eye looked, and told I mean, you I, that. Yeah. Especially a guy who's been there, who's their franchise. I'm like, I'm their all-time franchise leader in percentage. You know, it's not sure. like I. You know, it'd be different if I was, you know, I'd been there and done mm -hmm. well. It's like, how are you going to say that and then just completely 180 degree turn and do, you know, it's just one of those things. I'm like, man, how am I supposed to? Tr and then you just realize that this is a business and like, you got to understand that you got to take care of yourself and you can't believe anything anybody says. Just go out and do your thing. And if you kick well, it's going to be fine. And So you got beat out the next year. They brought Murray in. Yeah. He beat you out. What was that competition like? Uh, let's just say he did not beat me out. So, well, I'm, okay, okay. No, no, you know what I'm saying. You know, right. Yeah, but that's what that's the tab. You know, they're going to say that just to cover their. Uh, it was. Um, he's a good kicker. I mean, but um, I had a. I was expensive, and mm -hmm. I had a very high price tag, and I was coming off an injury. So right. they, had, I, they had all the excuses not to keep me. You know, so. Right. Well, he got the spot. Right, yeah. beat you out is, is what. Yeah, he got the spot. Yeah. Because a lot of circumstances added up to yeah. that that year. But was that, I mean, was that a different competition than other ones that you had been in before just from a mentality standpoint? No, because, I mean, I thought that, you know, as long as I, because obviously I'd, I'd, I'd been there, obviously mm -hmm. I knew it was going to be a little bit different because we had a new head coach, new GM, because, I, you know, I had something to prove to, to show that I was back the same way. But, I mean, once I, you know, they saw me kicking, obviously from my standpoint, my head I was kicking the exact same as I was kicking before you know right obviously Mike Kanan was there our punter so he was kicking off still so we had our old had our thing going so I was just kicking field goals and I mean obviously we were we were both in the high 80 percent range field goal wise and you know the biggest thing I th so I think from a standpoint in my head I felt like nothing was different but when <laughs> my GM in April we, I was out there kicking you know getting back into it he goes you know he wanted to introduce himself and he Jason Light he was like hey Connor I was like hey how's it going and he was like yeah you know I'm still still learning how to uh, scout kickers I was like okay so that's when I knew this could be a different uh, right because you know it's you watch ball flight you watch the way the ball comes off someone's foot and 
my I had I I pride myself in a pretty pure ball. I hit a good I hit an NFL quality ball every time, and uh, you know it might not go in every time, but mm-hmm. the quality's there. You know, right. it's not like I'm spraying a ball left and right. You know, hitting a line driver, and um, but it you know so I I felt I felt like I had a great off season. I felt great, and uh, you know, but I knew after I got hurt and the learning about the business side of it, I knew I was in trouble because I was highly paid and our funder was highly paid, and I knew that if someone was going to take if someone was going to be out it was going to be me just because of the injury and mm-hmm. they and a lot of teams tried to save some money at our position so it's uh I, it wasn't a different competition but i just i mean i feel like i kicked great but it's, yeah. i just knew that you know from the injury standpoint if i wasn't like if i didn't show them that i was something if they didn't see me as being better than i was then i knew i was in trouble because they had that they could find a way to to do something differently which they did which it is what it is. So then you end up in Denver with Peyton Manning. Yeah. Twice you made five field goals in a game out there for the Broncos. I mean, Peyton. It, what else? Do, what else can you do? Peyton's a great. He, it's like that's a great guy to play for because he always gets you close. And I had a lot of. I mean, I've never kicked. I had two five field goal games, a four field goal game. I think my first game was five field goals. Yeah. And uh, you know, I knew I was gonna. I knew it was a great situation for me because I knew he'd get us in field goal range. Obviously, he's you know he throws the ball and he gets you in scoring position every time. Sure. So, uh, you know, it was uh, you know Coach Fox and Jeff Rogers, special teams coach at the time, who's now obviously they're the same yeah. guys in in Chicago. You know, it, it was nice to get back with a guy because Coach Fox has seen me kicking in Tampa because he coached obviously against mm-hmm. me a bunch of Carolina. So, uh, yeah, I mean. I learned so much from that that year just playing with Peyton was my locker mate. So I mean, oh wow! So was, I had to put on his pads a lot of times, which is pretty funny. So uh, he's probably one of the nicest and just it just it was cool to be able to watch. You know, being twenty, what was I then? Twenty, twenty six, twenty seven, yeah. older now. But just I never played on a team with the quality of players that that the Denver had. You know, you had De, you know Demarcus Ware, Demarius yeah. Thomas. I mean, you had. Peyton, you had so many great guys to learn from, and I just—I'm always a guy who just because we don't—we can only kick so much. So I love just watching and sitting there and learning and just seeing their mannerisms and uh, and things like that. So I mean, that you know, I, I needed to come back and have a good year, and uh, you know, obviously I didn't play the whole year, but I definitely think I made the most of you know I think it was 94 percent that year for yeah. me, and that obviously helped me in the long run because you know, uh, Coach Fox liked me enough to bring me into Chicago. So it was, uh, yeah, it was a uh, it's. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I've been on a. It's been a few teams these days, so. I'm well, still... but the, now, now, you go back to Tampa again, yeah. though. Oh, yeah. What what, Tampa, what, Tampa. what was that? <laughs> what was that like? Was that? I mean, obviously you need obviously you need a job. You want to kick. Yeah. Well, see, I went back. I was resigned in the training camp, and then they cut me. Right. And then brought me back again. Right. Yeah. So it was. Uh, yeah, it was. I mean, I think that. The, from a fan standpoint, I think the front office and uh, not the not from the GM and head coach standpoint, but like from the front offices and like you know any, anybody from ticket sales to so I was always the guy that wanted to go you know I wanted to interact with people and I wanted to get to know people on the other side of because there's so many things that you know there's so many different people that run you know run an organization and mm-hmm. you don't see that you don't see that front office side from like the t- ticket sales to marketing to people who actually are the ones that get everything ready on game day. And sure. I always wanted to be a guy to interact at lunch or go up and just, I would, you know, go get Starbucks for people just because it's fun, you know, just because I wanted to, that's just the guy, the guy I've always been. I've, I've been raised to where I want to interact with different people. And I think that, you know, the, from the kitchen staff to everyone, they were probably the happiest I've ever, I've never seen that kind of, you know, when I came back, you know. Yeah. And, kind of like Norm walking into yeah, Cheers. So it's, just, <laughs> it's just like, I, I, you know, I'd been there for so long yeah. that, it, you know, and, I think everyone was pretty disappointed when I when I was released, and uh, and you know, obviously, so I just it, it was it was kind of it was it was very emotional to go back there again because they they asked me to work out again for them, and I'm like I just was cut by you four weeks ago. What's changed? You know, so yeah. it's like I mean, coach, like what what has changed that you want to see me? You know, so it's just it's just a it's a it's a it's a grind. It's a grueling process, but I felt like I. Obviously came back and the kicker before me had missed like six field goals or something like that in the first four games and, uh, and I thought I came in and really you know kind of solidified the position again and had a great. It's the first year I'd kicked off since 2010, right? And had uh, I think over 50 percent touchbacks yeah. and really what I was really more worried about was my kickoffs and I mean our GM was like if you can just get to the goal line, 
he was because we weren't making field goals. So sure. he was like, just make field goals for me. And obviously, I hit 11 straight. Yeah. And I went first game, I had five touchbacks and ended up 50% on touchbacks. So I thought, all right. So, you know, I went 23 to 28 and had yeah. 50% touchbacks. I'm in good shape. And I just, you know, I solidified this. And, you know, there's nothing to worry about here. I'm back. And, yeah. And then they, uh, I get a text from my agent in February, or no, in April last year, on the draft, and they're like, he's like, please do not tweet anything. And that's when they drafted Mr. Aguayo yeah. in the second round. And yeah. um, I'm a business, I'm a very, uh, I'm a stand-up guy, so like I'm kind of one of those guys that like, it's kind of what happened to, I heard yesterday with Jeremy Macklin or whatever yeah. came out saying that the GM left him a voicemail saying he was yeah. released, you know. And um, I'm being pretty honest in this conference. Yeah, this is, I like to be – I want. I need to open up a little bit because I've held back a lot of what I'm really – but, you know, that's kind of – that's pretty bad. To, you know, a GM should call you into his office or get you personally on the phone, not leave you a voicemail saying you're, one of your veteran stars has been you know, released. And I didn't get – I didn't get – I think I didn't get anything. Nothing, nothing, no no communication no, at all from like, Tampa? Nothing about, you know, they, until after the fact that I saw he was drafted. Dirk called me on the phone. I didn't answer because I didn't want to do I mean, right. just, out of, just out of like a bit, just like a, from a, from a honesty and just very, I think a man-to-man kind of, mm-hmm. uh, how I would do business is you would tell a guy who's your franchise all-time, every record in Tampa history right. to, hey, we're going to make this, we're making this pick a couple days before. This is what we're, just, I, I know they've been, they knew they were going to make this pick a long time ago. And they could have, you know, I get back there in April in the offseason, you know, I have to rent an apartment. I have to, mm-hmm. I have expenses that I have to to pay for to live down there. And they could have easily just been like, hey, Connor, you know, we love what you've done here, but we, I, I knew, they they knew they were You drafting. could have taken that yeah. a lot easier yeah, than, and, than what happened. Yeah, it's just kind of one of, it's just, they just rubbed me the wrong way where it's just like from a business standpoint, I just think it's bad business. You don't. Mm-hmm. You could have told me in April that hey we're we're probably going to make this pick and this is a guy we really think highly of and I would have felt I'd been you know what thank you for actually being honest right. with me and but no, instead I got a I'm at home in Wilmington and I you know I just had a bad feeling I told my dad I was like they're probably this is Tampa this is what they do and I just had a bad feeling about it and I saw it I saw it happen and you know I didn't see it happen I was with my buddies I didn't want I didn't want, but I got a text from my agent and he goes please don't tweet anything I'm like you got to be kidding me. So I looked on the TV and it's like drafted second round. Which, yeah. And I'm just like, you know, it's like, I'm, it's just like you, you, you spend all, you, I spent, you know, two months of rent, you know, which is not cheap in Tampa. Mm-hmm. And I'm not, you know, it's just kind of, it's just like, you know, you could have spared me the kind of, if you would have just been a man about it and just, as I, they knew they were going to do this the whole, all along, you know, just tell me that, you know, I'm not your guy. So what was that camp like? Was, with the, I didn't the, even go. I didn't, did, yeah. I didn't go. Yeah. I didn't, I had my agent. I had my agent, I said, hey, Rob, Rob Roche and my agent, I right. said, hey, Rob, I want you to deal with this. I can't even, I didn't call, because Dirk left me a voicemail, and yeah. I was like, this is after they drafted him, I was like, I don't even want to, uh, I don't want to talk to him, like, just tell him they'll release me, and, because, I mean, when you pay a guy, yeah, second round pick, you're, he's the guy. Yeah, you're paying you, him know, a, you don't take a, you don't take a second round pick, you're, you're paying not him a million keep. bucks signing bonus, I yeah. mean, he's going to be the guy, so I knew he was the guy, so I was like, you know what, Rob, I'd, they've treated me some of the worst I've ever seen from an organizational standpoint, just from a business standpoint, you just don't yeah. treat people like that. And I, I mean, I think at least you could just, just honesty is huge for me. Yeah. I'd rather just hear it face to face or on the phone. Like, Hey, we're going to make this decision and I'm okay with it. But so you try out and you go to new Orleans, yeah. that doesn't work out, but then you get a call from John Fox again. Yeah. And I, I know you and coach Fox were out there at Eagle point during the golf <laughs> tournament recently. You have a special relationship with that man. He's just a uh, – well, I think it all started with how I perform. It's all about how you perform and how you – production. And I think right. that he saw how I came in, you know, in a pretty tough situation on Monday Night Football in zero-degree weather and came in and hit five field goals in Denver. When for, he was the coach for the Broncos. When he was the coach. And I think yeah. he – I did really well for him. So he was like, you know what, we have a guy who's – we think's a pretty good kicker. So let's, you know, let's let's go get him. And, and he's obviously at a reasonable price as well. And, I mean – the cool thing is how the whole NFL works is, you know, Ryan Pace, the GM, was in New Orleans, so he knew Coach Payton down there. Right. So I'm sure, you know, uh, you know, the funny thing is Kai Forbath and I both kicked lights out. And, and we in were both, the New we, Orleans oh, camp. We were yeah. both 90-plus percent. I mean, I mean, we went on – we barely missed. I mean, we had a heck of a camp. Both of us should have – either of us should have gotten the job. Yeah. And obviously no one got the job. Right. But I think – with the way the NFL works, you know, ever you just can never burn a bridge because 
you know, you just never know who, where someone's going to be. Mm-hmm. Ryan Pace was in New Orleans, so I'm ho- I'm thinking maybe Sean Payton might have said something to Ryan because you know reaching out. You saying, never you'll find that out in twenty years somewhere. Yeah, somebody so, will tell you a story. Uh, it's just kind of a small, and you know, it's it's and you know, Coach Fox and I obviously have a good relationship. I've been productive for him, and you know, I think he saw it as an opportunity, and you know, I was very blessed because, you know, if if I would have stayed in New Orleans, I wouldn't have gotten the job, and I would have been not kicking for probably half a year like what happened yeah. to Kai because, you know, luckily I was able to get there immediately for the first game of the season where Kai got cut that first week for a rookie in, in New Orleans, and he was out for a few weeks. So it's a uh, – so tell you what, man, it's a uh, – <laughs> our position is very interesting because there's no backups, which no one understands. Right. It's like there's nothing – But you've kicked in Tampa. You've kicked in Denver. You've kicked in Chicago. Cold weather, warm weather – is there a difference the way the ball feels coming off your feet if oh, it's ab- 70 degrees and if it's zero and wind chill of minus 10 or minus 15? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, it's a whole other ball game kicking in Chicago, and uh, it's a tough place to kick. I mean, I, Denver's, Denver's tough, but with the altitude, it helps a little bit, and it's not quite as windy. Obviously, Chicago's the windy city, and it really is. I mean, it's, the ball's heavy out there, and you know, uh, the, from a grass standpoint, we, and I look at everything. You know, mm-hmm. grass is higher, it's thicker, it's just tougher to kick out there. And in, in, in Chicago, we played back in Tampa in November last year, and it was like I walked out there in pregame. It's ninety degrees. I'm like, whoa, this yeah. is this is easy. Yeah. So you know, it's just uh, it's it's different. I mean, it's a as a kicker, you know, a specialist kicker or punter, um, you know, even a quarterback. I mean, when you can, when you play in a dome, it's just one less mental thing you have to worry about when you wake up because you know there's no wind. the 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 air temperature is going to be very nice, to be in the seventies probably. And but when you wake up in, in in Chicago on a Sunday morning, you know you just never know what you're going to get. So it's just another added mental, another added stress to your to your to your you know to your mental state. And uh, so it's just, it's a it's a grind. You know, it's a different. You know, September October aren't bad, but when you get into the November December days of, of Chicago, it's what does it feel like? When it comes off your foot, it's it, it feels like you're hitting a hitting a brick wall. Does I mean, it really? It's just a very. I mean, especially when you get it gets cold, cold. Like you know, we played against Green Bay. It was minus eighteen wind chill. I yeah. mean, it was minus eight in, in in the first half, and the ball was coming off decently. But as the second half came, and it it got you know ten degrees even cooler, minus eighteen, I could barely get the ball to the ten yard line. It's just uh, you know, it's just the way it is. It's it's nothing mm-hmm. you can do about it. It's just a tough. Uh, it's just tough, tough, tough uh, t- temperature-wise. Yeah. You I mentioned was... mental. Mm-hmm. How much of it is mental? I always say it's 90% mental and, and 10% physical because everyone at our level has the has the physical tools. I mean, you mm-hmm. wouldn't be playing in the NFL sure. if you couldn't, if you weren't good enough. So the, the rest of it, the 90% of it is just trusting in yourself and and understanding that there's going to be situations you're going to go through that you know you got to deal with and you got to just be positive about it and I th- so I've always I mean I mean going seeing a psycho- sports psychologist is stuff that I think people are scared to do because they think that it's not cool to do but I mean we have one on staff full time at at, at uh, Chicago or she's you know obviously come, she's in the building pretty much every day and has helped me a ton and I went back to, to to college and had a sports psychologist, but I mean, it, you learn so much about how strong your brain is, and from a mental standpoint, from visual visualization to just kind of your to prepare for to a kick. I mean, a lot of it's similar to golf. I mean, you step into the play box and into the box, and you just gotta you block everything out, and you have your routine. And I mean, that's really what it is. I mean, it's all mental. I mean, if if you don't, it's like anything. If you don't believe in what you can do, then nine times out of ten, you're not going to be successful. I mean, you got. I mean, there's kicks out there where you just you got to believe in yourself because it's windy. You got to play it. When I, that's why when I play golf, that's great because when I go start kicking, I'm like I'm so much better. I can put the ball anywhere I want when I kick, but my golf game is terrible. So it actually <laughs> helps me a lot. So yeah, it's, you know I watch these golfers and I'm like this. It's going to the Wells Fargo. You you realize just how good, and that's why they're professionals. I mean they yeah. can put the ball anywhere they want from any kind of angle. And, and the only thing I could ever have is when you hit a golf shot and you hit it in the sweet spot and you hit it pure. You can barely feel it coming off the club. Yep. Do you have the same feeling if you hit it pure? Does it barely? Do you barely feel it kicking? Yeah, it's a, it's the same kind of uh, it, sensation wise. It's a little bit different from you still feel it off your foot. Obviously, right. you're not. But I always try to whenever people see me kick, they usually say, "Man, it looks effortless," and that's what you want. I mean, that's when you know it's you hit it well. I mean, 
when I hit a 50 yarder, I want it to look like I'm hitting an extra point. You know, nothing. It's just very effortless, very smooth. And I think that's the same thing with golf. You watch these golfers; they're just very they're effortless with their swing. But it goes. I've always known, like whenever I try too hard, you end up not hitting the ball as far. Right. And uh, I think it's the same thing with football. And you know, with kickoffs, is something I've really had to work on a lot because I've always had I've had a you know it's always been an uphill battle for me um, with my leg strength and people saying I can't kick off. So I mean. My whole thing I've learned is that when I just try to when I try to kill it, it doesn't go half as far as when I'm just smooth and just really just trusting my form and stuff like that. So I think it's the same with with kind of the golf thing. And you just you know that's just you know I've always like a just a pure swing. You'll just see if you watch it on film that it's just it looks effortless and it just looks like you're barely kicking it, but it's going 55, 60 yards. And that's what mm-hmm. I've always prided myself in. And I've, you know that's kind of where I've always been from a technique standpoint. What is your routine? When you go out, do you have a routine? For, have you had one? Have you changed it at all? Is or it like pre-game? Or I mean, yeah, pre- when you, no, you get called out to do a kick. Obviously, they say field goal, we want three. Yeah. And Barth goes running out there in his Chicago Bears uniform. Is your, is your yeah. routine the same now that it was in, say, Miami or New Orleans or UNC or Hoggard? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's been pretty, pretty much the same. I mean, I'm very weird about my – I have a superstition with my shoelaces. I learned in Kansas City I can't. Even when I'm out and about just in town, I can't see shoelaces. It freaks me out. So really? I, I tuck my shoelaces into my shoe. Even when I'm out, and if I'm wearing nice, if I'm wearing dress shoes out, I always, if they come untucked, I lose it. That's really weird. I can't, wow. from like a, so from like a contact standpoint, I like to see like a very flush and just very not, not, not obstructed view and just very, you know, everything looks just very clean. Because that's something that could toss the ball one way or the other, just or, the, or is it just just Mentally, just seeing yeah. the laces just throws my eyes. I just feel like I'm not going to hit a pure ball. It's weird. So I've so you'll see me every time the offense gets the ball, I always tie my shoes. I always retie my kicking shoe, tight as I can get it, and I tuck my laces in every time we go on, on offense. Mm-hmm. So that's why I don't wear gloves in cold games, because I have to be able to tie my shoes. Or so it's, <laughs> I'm not going to try to take my gloves off. So that's like Something I've done since I, my rookie year. I've learned yeah. it, I learned it from a punter in Kansas City, and uh, he always tucked his laces in. And after that, I was like, man, that's kind of a cool. I can really see the surface, and I feel like I can I can make good contact, and it just feels better. You know, if it feels better, you're gonna. They always sure. say, if you oh, yeah. feel better, you're gonna play yeah. better. So right. now, do you look at the do you look at the do you look at the flags on the goalpost? What do you do when you get out on the field? Yeah, I mean, I'll so when we cross the fifty, uh, obviously we have nets on the side of the field, and uh, we have one on each side, and. We always make it to where whatever um, whatever way we are going, we put the net on the opposite side of the field but face it the same way, so we're kicking into the same wind. Mm-hmm. So I'll start kicking about – I've always prepared. So once we once we cross the 50, I'll start kicking into the net because obviously it's a lot of kicks just during a whole – in a whole game. And, uh, sure. So that's what I've always done. We'll start kicking, and then, um, you know, pregame obviously is where I – get the wind and I figure out the factors of what I want to do in my range and all that. Mm-hmm. And, um, but when you get on, when you walk onto the field, do you have a routine that you'll go, you'll look down, look yeah, up, I mean, look up? Yeah. I just get, you know, I get my, obviously I get, my holder gets the spot for me and then I pick out a, usually pregame I'll try to find a spot behind the uprights. That's like, you know, at the top in the middle. So that's kind of where I aim at every time. So I'll, I'll find that spot again. When I take my steps back, I'll find the spot and I'll, you know, I'll take my steps over and I'll try to, hit that spot every time so you have something to kind of visually look at so it's mm-hmm. a good way to from a mental standpoint to try to hit that little small small space that's why i try to work on tiny i try to work on narrow uprights as much as i can just from a because i know if i can make them on that then i can make them on sure. the regular ones so yeah. yeah i mean it's um superstitions yeah. after a kick you mean do you do you thank the first person first do you thank the second person do you, you always, go get over your tee or what you always uh you always thank your holder mm-hmm. we always you know sh- you know high five and then I'll just go up. To, we always go up to the line and I'll shake everyone's hand. Cause I mean, sure. obviously if they don't not, give you the yeah, time, it's yeah. not about me. I mean, it's, I mean, obviously I'm finishing the kick, but you know, your O line is they're They're protecting for you. And obviously they're, they're busting their butt. They get down there. And a lot of them just played 12 plays on offense. Right. Then they got a block for you. And then obviously your snapper is getting the ball back there for you. So uh, Pat and so Pat O'Donnell's my holder. And then Pat scales is my snapper. So we're, we're like the three amigos. We'd pretty much do everything together, and mm-hmm. that's kind of what you have to do. I mean, you got to build that that bond, and uh, and uh, so it's, you know, my holder obviously is the first guy I think, and then we just go, you know, you go down there and you shake everyone's hand. What does a good holder do for you? He just knows. Uh, it's a comfort thing. He knows he knows how you like the ball held, um, the lean you want on it, because you know if it's windy out, left or right, you might want a little bit more to the right, a lean into him or a little bit of lean out towards him depending on the wind. And Now, do you say that lean? I mean, do you communicate with with each other in that oh, yeah. four I mean, or five seconds? Oh, yeah. I mean, we'll, I mean, we communicate 
the week of practice. I mean, he knows. I mean, he knows. I mean, that was the, that's the hardest thing for us. You know, I came in week one last year, and I had never worked with them at all. Right. So they were getting to know me. I'm getting to know them. So it takes a little bit to – and as you as the season went on last year, I really got in a groove. Yeah. And I think I made my last 14 to 15. Yeah. So it's mm-hmm. – you can see where that comes, you know, the, the, it really is the thing about you got to mesh with those guys because you, you don't know them that well. And, uh, um, but, you know, this year, I mean, so like coming into camp this year, coming into offseason this year, Pat knew exactly, he knows exactly how I want the ball held. Right. And Scales knows my personality and he knows everything that I want. And I don't, you know, if he snaps it, I'd rather him miss like inside than outside because mm-hmm. if it's funny, no one knows, but myself and I think maybe one other guy, Ryan Suckup, are the only two guys that watch the actual snap happen. So no one knows about that. Most kickers completely shut off the snap, and they're only looking at the spot of the ball, where the finger is of the holder. So most, Why do you look at the snap? I've just That's the way I've always been taught, and I like I can't change it. It's something that's been sure. – I've been just so comfortable yeah, after, with. After doing yeah. it for so long. Um, a lot of coaches don't like that. Um, you don't see many kickers do that anymore, but it's me and I think maybe – Jenikowski, I don't know if he does or not, but mm-hmm. maybe me and Suckup are the only two. So, but from my standpoint, it's like, well, if I see, a high, I can see a high snap before it happens, yeah. or if it's going to be a little bit left or right, I can. I already know I need to slow my approach down, which I think from my standpoint helps. But there's a lot more moving parts because you're having to go from looking at this at the snap to moving your eyes back to the spot. So it's a very it's a very different process. But a lot of guys look they look just at the spot, so they don't even see the snap. They just see the holder's hand come up when the ball is being snapped, and so that's pretty different. So, but like I said, we just know each other so well now that I think that uh, this you trust year, if it's yeah, a trust I think thing. that it's a trust thing. I mean, I think that um, it's anything from a center exchange with the quarterback. I mean, got to get to know the guy, and uh, I think that you'll see a big improvement. You know, you'll, you'll see a big year from all of us just because we know each, we have another we've had another year to really grow as a, yeah. as a unit, and I think that's. Worst piece of trash talking that ever came at to uh, uh, at Connor Barth. I don't know if I can say that. And I know you can't say the words, <laughs> but I. But well, I, I mean, can, there's a lot of. Uh, but I can imagine. I mean, anybody just you know nah, really trash talk you? No, nah, not too bad. I mean, they they leave the kickers alone. Pretty. I mean, the you know being around obviously playing for ten years, you play against a lot of guys that you've been teammates with. So they'll say some funny. You know, they'll yeah. they'll say some funny stuff because you know I block it out. You're blocked. You know when the, when they you know when the ball's there's a timeout or there's the balls being spot, you'll you'll hear some commotion. But when that ball is like when they blow the whistle and it's ready to roll, you pretty much you block out everything. But yeah. uh you know, I've had guys talk about your mom and those kind of things. <laughs> but it's it's you know, it's just funny guy. Yeah, you know, most of it's fun. I mean, you know, it's yeah. at the end of the day it is really a game and I think guys truly lo- I mean, they love the you know, they love the sport and uh you know, there's no real hate. I mean, there you know, everyone really just enjoys playing and just jokes with each other and there's mm-hmm. no really you know, people do get in fights and stuff like that, but uh, and I mean, I haven't had. Like I said, I don't ever, I don't bring anything upon myself to really get any trash. You know, I don't do anything. I'm not a right. jerk. I don't. Yeah, you don't trash talk. I don't anybody like else cheap first. shot guys behind yeah. after kickoffs and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. so I, there's nothing really. They shouldn't really have to trash talk. There's nothing really yeah. to say to me. But I mean, you know, you'll hear a few a few things here and there. But I mean, I'm sure when you get in those like, when there's a fumble and there's an actual like pile of guys. I can't even imagine what is. <laughs> what is grabbed, what is said, and what is – I've heard some funny things. So I'm sure there is some yeah. – I'm sure that's a whole other – I don't ever want to be on the bottom of that. Let's put it that way. And that's something happened if I'm if I'm on the bottom yeah. of a pile. It's a Super Bowl in its fourth quarter. Yeah, yeah. This is not good if I'm having to get down in a dog pile or some sort, but it's – Does When a coach tries to ice you with a timeout, does that work? Um, I used to think it did, but I, I – I think it. I think now, if as a as an older as a veteran guy, I think it helps a little bit. It lets you kind of calm down and lets you kind of if you get, get another chance to kind of visualize and kind of set yourself up again. Because I think you just let the guy kick. I mean, that's my opinion. You just let, see what hap- whatever happens happens. I mean, it's. Um, but I mean, you know, some people might say something differently. But for me, I think it just gives me a chance to kind of take a step back, you know, regroup, and because you know sometimes you're thrown out there pretty quick, you know. The worst part is when you don't. Your quarterback's like, "I want to go for it on fourth down," but your coach is like, "No, we're not. We're going to kick it." And then you're out there with 15 seconds mm-hmm. within the play clock, and you got to get going. So, yeah. give me a timeout. I'll, you know, it gives me a chance to kind of settle down and kind of find my spot again and adjust everything and kind of visualize. So I think honestly, icing. I think it helps. I think it helps the kicker. I mean, but do you really? Like every, I mean, I think it. I think it for me personally, it does. Yeah. But. You know, other kickers. I mean, everyone's different. Other kickers could say completely different. They they'd rather they they hate getting ice. They would rather just kick. Now, the worst is when you actually got to go to a, you know, like a 
the worst is that with the new extra point now. Mm-hmm. You know, they when you when they score when teams score a touchdown, a lot of times they review it. Now that's a that's kind of a pain because you gotta you're sitting there for a while. So right. it's but it's uh it's but it's getting nice. to kind of just gives you a chance to regroup because most of the time it's going to be on a game winner or yeah end a half thing, and you can kind of really settle down because your your emotions are higher. And what does like it that. mean to you to have your brother break your record at Chapel Hill? Oh, it's, it means everything. I mean, I get. I get pretty like when I go and speak to to groups and stuff. I get pretty emotional about it because he doesn't quite get the you know. I've always kind of had the. I'll probably get emotional here, but I've kind of had the line, you know the spotlight a lot, and people don't realize how good of a kicker he was. Yes, I mean he was. I mean he was sensational at Carolina, and uh, I mean he's just kind of the same guy as just cool and collective, just low key. Doesn't like the spotlight. Just kind of does his thing, and just no one realizes I think he might be the all-time leading scorer in the history of the school in football. I mean, I think Gio might have passed him, but he's up there. He's top three. Kicker-wise, yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he might be all-time, though. Yeah. And um, it's just, it's just, uh, it means everything to me. I mean, I'm never, I've never been a guy about records and things like that. I mean, it's cool to know that you've you've got some here and there, but mm-hmm. to, to have my younger brother do it, I mean, I was like, and I was able to go and I, we were on our bye week, the week that he broke my record and yeah. I was able to actually go to the game and that was pretty cool. I got to go on the field and shake his hand during, during it and everything. It was pretty cool. It was just a very special moment for me because he's, you know, it's not easy to to come in and fill a, your brother, a older brother's shoes. He's had yeah. a pretty good career at Carolina. I mean, I was, I was hoping he wouldn't go to Carolina just because I didn't want him to have to do that, but it was, you know, from a standpoint of, from a social standpoint, it was awesome because he knew everybody on the team already. <laughs> yeah, Half, sure. Some of my teammates were still playing. Yeah. So he knew, you know, it was great. You know, I, but it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, he's a, he's a great, he's, you know, we really got, we didn't, we were four years apart. So when I'm in high school, he's not in high school yet. Right. So we missed each other. So we really didn't become really close till probably when he was, you know, his senior year of high school, you know, freshman year of college, because, you know, we were so far apart. You know, that four years is a big, mm-hmm. it's a big jump. So when you're, when you're a senior in, in high school and he's a, you know, in eighth grade, there's really not much of a, there's not much, you know, there's yeah, not much. Yeah, that cavern to, yeah, is there's, big. There's yeah. not much to talk about. But yeah. now, I mean, we're the closest we've ever been. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, yeah, he's, he's my, he's my, I mean, he's the, I, lo- I love that guy. I mean, he's, yeah. we have such a good relationship and there's never, ever any tension. There's, we always joke about it. And Are you surprised he never got more of an opportunity to kick professionally I'm just I'm, I'm not surprised because I know the NFL and it's just a very yeah. it's a very it's like I said it's a tough business and it's honestly a lot of it at our position is just timing yeah I think it was timing um you know he just I always tell people now if if I would have come out now in 2017 I would never have made it I mean the guys are so big and so much faster kickers are kicking the ball so much farther mm-hmm. um that the only reason I am is because I have I have a little bit of a you know, I've uh, you know I've some experience. I've a lot of experience. You know, experience can help you sometimes. And uh, you know, I just think that uh, you almost have to be perfect as a rookie coming out, especially if you weren't drafted. Yeah. And obviously, he kicked some. He had a fifty-eight yarder in rookie yeah. minicamp. I mean, he had a pretty good. He hit the ball well and and stuff like that. But like you said, he, he he'd come up. He'd be a little erratic on some things. And as a as a rookie plays kicker, you it's almost and and, and to be a guy who's kind of just getting a shot. You know, he didn't he didn't have the I kicked some longer field goals than he did in college, so he didn't have the longer field goals, and mm-hmm. I think that hurt him a little bit um, from a statistical standpoint. So I think that he would like he'd make a fifty-eight yarder, but then he'd come up short on like a fifty-two yarder. So it's like, yeah, I think coaches were kind of like, oh, does you know we we can't have that inconsistency and stuff like that. But uh, but I mean, you know, it's like I said, it's the NFL's it's tough, you know. I mean, I'm just happy he was able to kind of experience a little bit of it, and it'd have been awesome to see him. I think he can. We went and kicked a month ago, and I swear he's better than he was and. When he was when he when he's kicking, you know, before, before and you guys work so. together on your kicking camp. How cool is that? That's awesome. I and mean, we've been, uh, you know, my dad Tom is actually kind of the he kind of coordinates everything. But uh, yeah, Casey and I have been doing it now for I want to say it's like five years. Yeah, and, um, it's just kind of a cool way to give back. And um, yeah, you know, it, it's it's a free camp, obviously. Yeah. And, and I don't ever want kids to have to pay to come out and have some fun. And it's more of a we do it. From, we'll do it from five thirty to eight o'clock. And I learned my lesson doing it in the, like the heat of the day. <laughs> we, we had a kid just noon to two. <laughs> we had a kid not. He had he had too many donuts before he came out. Oh, and boy. my we took him through. We you know we took him through a warm up and it was hot and he you know wasn't good. So we yeah. learned our lesson that let's do it at night. So <laughs> we're doing it July thirteenth, um, Thursday night at Hoggard yeah. from five thirty to eight. And uh, I always tell. Everybody bring you can bring doesn't matter how old your kids are, just come out, have fun. It's yeah. not about 
there's actually some there'll be some there's some really good kids that'll be there but it's more about just coming out and having fun and uh, you know we you know the nfl play 60 is such a big initiative to get kids mm-hmm. to be active and that's my kind of thing just get kids out there and be active because i mean i'm not a video game guy i never was I, i'm lucky that i just never got sucked into that whole whole thing but i know a lot of kids are and so if you can get out and be active and have some fun and it's always a good time you get a free shirt and surf yeah, there you uh, go Surfberry, they've been great about helping us out. So they give out uh, free Froyo and stuff like that. They'll give a little a coupon and stuff. So it's a cool. It's starting to become more of a. People are catching on to it and want yeah. to help more, which is really cool. And that's just the way Wilmington is. How much longer do you want to play? And what do you want to do when you finally say I've kicked my last field goal extra point? You know, I, that's a that's a tough question because I every off season I, you know, ten years was my goal. I'll be going into my tenth year this year. Um, I don't know. I've, every year, every off season, I ask myself how much longer because you know it's. I'm a very passionate person, and and I get very. I'm always a want. I always like to have new challenges and things like that. So I mean, I'm I'm getting to some real estate development now, and um, I'll I'll play as long as you know, as long as I'm enjoying it. You know, when mm-hmm. it comes to a point where I'm just like I'm hating going into work and just not enjoying playing football, then I'll I'm gonna have to have a talk with my agent and my parents, which they're not gonna want to hear because everyone's gonna say, you know what. Play as long as you can, take mm-hmm. the money, and but you know at the end of the day, it's not all about that. It's about you got to be happy, and you got to. There's a time and place for everything, and I got a few more years left in me. I think that I, you know I still want to. I'd love to have a really good year this year in Chicago, and then you know maybe sign another three year, you know maybe three more years, thirty five maybe, mm-hmm. you know, thirty four, and and but um I'm getting into some real estate development now. I'm flipping a house right now, so um. That's kind of something I have a passion for. Is getting ready now tougher than it was, say, five or six years ago? Oh, absolutely. I mean, your body is just not. I mean, I'm only 31, but you know, <laughs> uh, it's it's. I, I mean, as a kicker, I can't imagine other positions that you know get hit and have to hit every day. But uh, just from a, from just like little minor aches and pains here and there, it's just your body doesn't quite respond the way it did when you were 21 or 22, and that's why these young kickers that come in, how oh, my leg's sore. I was like, don't even try to tell me your leg's sore. <laughs> I was like, tell me that in 10 years when you've, you know, yeah. so it's, you have no, I was like, you have no excuses right now. Yeah. So no, it's, you know, we have, you know, yeah, luckily the NFL, obviously big organ, you know, big business and stuff like that. You got massage therapists, you yeah. got, you know, stretching, you got stretching people, you got cold tubs, you got everything you need to kind of, you know, get your body ready. And you definitely, and playing in the colder weather, obviously you feel it a lot more than you do in, no, you, not, not how looking back though, ten years, cut, um, t- you know, a, a lot of times, resign, called back, success, fifty yarders. You've only missed two extra points in your entire career. Yeah. You've had the charity basketball game. You're trying to help. It changes your career. Uh, you have overcome so many times. I can't imagine that you would be you know, scared to do it again or, or, or not wanting to do it again because you've come back and come back and come back and come back. I'm definitely writing a book when I get done. Definitely going to do that. But because uh, I've seen so many things now just from everything. But no, I mean, it's it's tough. I mean, it's I mean, there's really nothing. I, I mean, I feel like I've seen everything that I can from a, from from the NFL and from the business standpoint that I just kind of I just kind of have fun with it now. I don't I don't really care what happens. Nothing you can't overcome at this point. No, I mean, there's really nothing you can, all you can really do is I've always told the younger kickers is just, you got to worry about yourself. Like you can't, I don't even watch the other guy kick most of the time because it doesn't matter if there's competition in camp with you. It doesn't matter how many kicks he makes because if you don't make your kicks, you're not going to, you're not going to be the guy there. So, mm-hmm. you know, I've, I, you know, from a, for, so from that standpoint, it's just, there's really not much else I can really, I mean, I've seen, I've seen it all. I feel like, so, I mean, I'm just going out there and just having fun with it and just, you know, just trusting and you're just having fun and enjoying yourself and enjoying your teammates because that's the one of the hardest things in the NFL is that it's so hard to guys don't stay with teams long anymore. You know, you don't have that. You know, in the old and older days, it was teams had were together for ten years. You know, you don't. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, maybe you know, New England's done pretty yeah. well with keeping their guys, but there's so much turnover now that it's it's hard to. Uh, you know, it's hard to make friends in the NFL. And when you do, it's you know, it's you gotta cherish that and enjoy it because you know, it's it's it's. You, you see so many transactions during the year. I mean, yeah. there was like there was a hundred transactions last year. You got guys coming off practice squad, and you just don't know. You you see a player, and you're like, well, you've never seen the guy before. So it's just a uh, when you do make some really good friends in the NFL, and you know this Chicago locker room is one of the best I've been around, just from mm-hmm. uh, just camaraderie standpoint. I've never seen the being older now. I'm one of the oldest guys in the locker yeah. room. Uh, 
just seeing just everyone gets along and everyone just seems to really care about each other and um that's what's pretty cool i mean we all hang out a lot of us hang out hang out off the field and we do stuff together we'll go you know go out on the boat and on this in the city out on the lake and have fun and uh, so it's 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 a different different feeling that i've had in a while so it's really cool and hopefully we can uh, we're i mean we're young teams so hopefully we can put some wins together yeah. and uh have a have a good have a good run and so we'll see but yeah it's you gotta just yeah, at this point now i'm just kind of it's stressful as always it's the nfl sure. it's a stressful business but you just gotta kind of take you gotta take a step back and just and i i i struggle at it myself but i you just gotta take a step back and just enjoy at this point just enjoy it i mean that's all you can really do because no. Well, it's yeah. been it's uh, it's been fun kind of watching yeah. your career from high school all the way through, and I uh, appreciate you carving out an hour plus for me today and, and joining us on the uh, podcast. It's been fun. Thanks for having me. When most of us talk about pro sports, we say uh, they're just playing a game. Well, Connor Barth's story will show you that it's more than just a game. It's hard work. It's a job, one that Connor Barth has been able to do and do well for ten years now in the National Football League. And by the way, that kicking camp that Connor and Casey Barth are hosting, it's Sunday, July 13th at Hoggard High School. All you have to do is bring a football, maybe a tee if you have one, show up at 1 o'clock and have some fun. If you know someone who you think would be a good interview for a future episode of the podcast, send me an email, jevans at wect.com. You can also reach out on Facebook or Twitter. I'm on those social media sites every day. And if you like what you hear on this episode, please leave a review. That way we can reach out and get some more new listeners. I'm John Evans. Thanks for being with us for this episode of One on One.